today's webinar on you see but you do not observe, discovering hidden threats with network forensics. Today's webinar is hosted by FireEye, a signatory of the Cybersecurity Tech Accord and a company that provides technologies and services to investigate cybersecurity attacks, as well as protect against malicious software. Last year, the Tech Accord announced a new partnership with the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise to strengthen cyber capacity building through the exchange of best practices. To further our commitment under that umbrella, we launched a series of webinars to help increase the understanding of key cybersecurity topics, such as the one you'll hear today. Today's webinar is presented by Bill Cantrell, VP of Network and Product Management of FireEye. Bill oversees the product management teams responsible for developing FireEye's network security and forensics portfolio of products. We welcome you to share questions using the chat box located on the right side of your screen, as there will be time at the end of the presentation to address questions. And now I'll turn the floor over to you, Bill. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the intro. I'm, I'm Bill Cantrell, I'm VP of uh, Product Management for the Network Product Lines, and uh, we will uh, be talking today about the network forensics part of that product line. So uh, uh, this was a company that came over as an acquisition several years ago, back in 2014, and has now uh, been, been integrated tightly into the uh, FireEye portfolio. So with that being said, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead here. Uh, there's the standard disclosure statement. Uh, we'll just leave that up there for a second and then uh, move right into the forensics piece. So why do you need network forensics? If we look at the uh, the market today or the, the network security space today, uh, I kind of did a look back at this slide. We, we've had this slide up in various forms for, for several years. We've talked about the average time uh, it takes to discover a breach in a network, um, the, the fact that customers have, have a lot of tools, that, that there's definitely a need to consolidate, um, and then um, constant attacks over time. So customers typically see recurrences. We see that uh, on our forensic side. We also see that with our, our managed defense team uh, where we'll, we'll have a customer that, uh, that we'll uh, work a breach at but have to go back in uh, later, a year or two later, uh, to, to uh, address another issue um, and the average costs of these breaches. So looking back a few years, uh, this, is, this has stayed pretty steady. The, the number of days that uh, it takes to discover a breach seems to stay in that 100 range. It, it fluctuates a bit. Um, the costs are obviously going up. I think just a couple of years ago, it was in the average cost was in the $3 million range. Now, now it's up over $4 million. So um, interesting to see that, that these numbers uh, continue uh, to either climb or, or stay in the same ranges. So um, unfortunately, we're not making a lot of product, but it, but it does show the need for the forensics capabilities, incident response, and, and that type of an infrastructure. So, so typically, what, what do customers do? It's, it's a bit of, uh, we liken it to whack-a-mole. It's a typical day of security uh, and network uh, SOC operations. They, um, you know, you'll get an alert that's triggered, triage that, uh, investigate the higher triage, the higher uh, uh, higher uh, level alerts, uh, use multiple tools to do that. So customers may start with a, uh, an alert generated by a device, it goes into a SIM. From that SIM, they'll pivot to one of their other consoles, whether it's a forensics console or back into the interface for a particular device. So kind of pivoting from dashboard to dashboard, uh, wrap up that event, what else was impacted, try and, and clean up that and then move on to the next one. So a lot of this, this mean time to resolution uh, can be quite long for some of the, uh, the actual security events where there's, there's forensics and triage needed. So, so what is network forensics and how does it fit in that world? It's network forensics. Um, so there's, there's forensics obviously is a, is a term that's used in a lot of areas, but, but in the network forensics world, we're talking about monitoring and analyzing computer network traffic for the purposes of, of information gathering, legal evidence, uh, looking for intrusions, hunting, and also, um, also, the, this can be used on an insider threat level as well. So we, we do have customers on the forensic side that, that will use the forensics analysis to look at insider threats and, uh, and, and malicious activity by, uh, by users within the, the valid users within the, the network. 
which is so this is a, a little bit different than the endpoint forensics or EDR market where you would be leveraging the endpoint uh, data and, and forensics on the, the hard drive and things like that. Uh, network forensics uh, leverages the network data and, and and that side of things. The advantage there, obviously, is that oftentimes when endpoints and servers are compromised, you can no longer rely on on some of the data that's actually there. Sometimes log files and systems are wiped before you know what's happened. So there would be no trace of of what the attacker did, what they what they got off of the system. So with a network forensic solution, which is separate from that. Uh, you can definitely have that back in time analysis that's uh, that's separate from any malicious activity. So, so what drives this need for the forensics? Obviously, we've talked about the the breaches and the fact that that folks are in the network. And once they're in now, they tend to stay in. We're seeing a lot more lateral movement. Uh, from FireEye, we, we have a lateral movement detection solution that, that we've introduced called Smart Vision. And it, you'll see that, it, it, you know, it, with a lot of these breaches now, you'll see, you'll see these attackers that get in and start to look laterally rather than just uh, getting to one system or, or just uh, one user and exfiltrating some data from there. They'll tend to be very quiet. They'll tend to stay inside the network and laterally move, not, not trying to give away uh, that the fact that they're there by trying to connect back out. So that, that's typically CNC traffic has been something that, um, that has you know, alerted folks to, to a breach in the network. But uh, we're seeing a lot more quiet lateral movement, uh, which, is, which is harder to detect because obviously folks know that, that some of the internal network is not instrumented as well as the, the north-south traffic. So we're seeing a lot of that. Traditional security tools, SIMs obviously just collect known log data and information. Um, they're, they're not, you know, they're not doing any active um, analysis. Firewalls, your traditional security tools. It, obviously, the threat vectors today are, are, are huge. There's, there's lots of ways in. So we, we all know folks can get in if they want to get in. Um, you know, obviously, you've got to have those first lines of defense, but, but they're not going to stop everything. Uh, and then uh, legacy PCAP tools. There's a lot of open source tools out there. There's a lot of uh, traditional PCAP companies, tools that were really designed more for sort of packet analysis from an operations perspective, looking at latency between packets, network issues, uh, not truly forensics tools that have a centralized uh, index and a way to, to look at flows across the network, reassemble um, asymmetric flows, things like that. So, so not true forensic solutions. Uh, a lot of times they get used for that, uh, and, and, um, but there's, there's a lot of limitations in that space. And then obviously the increased need for visibility. So these solutions, you know, we're seeing uh, the need for, for forensics as, as workloads move outside of just your internal network, perimeter list networks now uh, require more advanced forensics capabilities. Some of your workloads may be in the cloud. You'll need visibility there. Shortage of resources. You need something that's very efficient now so that your uh, your analysts don't have to pivot around. They can they can focus their time on, on on triaging an event and resolving it quickly. So the metrics of success for a forensic solution, if you were to say, what what does this do for me? What what's success look like in implementing network forensics? It's detecting breaches as soon as possible. Obviously, you want detection, and then reducing the mean time to to detect and respond. So you want that that time between uh, I believe there's an event going on now to here's all my my data, here's my forensics information, here's the here's the the packet analysis, here's here's some of the the payload, here's possible exfil data. You want to reduce that time to detect and respond uh, as as much as you can, and then and decrease uh, and uh, and increase the time spent on non-response related activities, right? That that time pivoting to different dashboards, that time trying to uh, to go over here and collect some some metadata, look at some logs, go back over here, grab some some PCAPs, take those out to a different console to reconstruct some of the traffic and look at what was in there. So all, all of that pivoting around just, just wastes a lot of time, takes time away from the an analyst in non-response related activities. So if you start to look at evaluating forensic solutions, what, what do you want to look for? What's, what's key in today's um, leading edge forensic solutions? What, what do you need from, uh, from that perspective? So let's, let's take a look at that. So 
some of your high level required capabilities, um, things that you want to look for in a forensic solution are obviously at the, the base level is high performance packet capture. You need to make sure that it, it can provide you packet capture at the rates your, your network runs at, at in a lossless fashion. If you're you're losing packets, that doesn't just mean, you. well, if I lost one in a uh, 100,000 packets, that doesn't sound too bad, but if that's the one packet in that flow uh, that had uh, uh, XFIL file in it, that one missing packet in that file now means you can't really reconstruct that entire file correctly, you can't get the MD5 for it, you can't look at all the data that was in it, so um, things like that are, are, are critical. Not being able to reconstruct those entire sessions because you missed a packet uh, is, is, is very key, and if that packet happens to have um, that that malicious actor's data in it, uh, that's going to mean you have no visibility into what happened. So um, being able to keep up with your data rates, being able to have lossless packet capture, very important. Intelligent filtering. As, as we move into higher and higher data rates, it means more and more data being stored to disk for solutions like this. Um, it also means cloud-based solutions where you're going to store data in the cloud. Uh, cloud storage can be a bit more expensive. So uh, looking at ways to uh, not just filter, but intelligently filter. So you, you don't want to be able to just uh, don't, don't store any DNS traffic. Uh, that, that's obviously not going to work. But you may want to not store any internal DNS for your, your own domain internally. You may want to um, not store certain traffic that you're not going to decrypt. So you may not want to keep encrypted payloads uh, if you're not going to decrypt them again. And and there may be other solutions like that. You may want not want to store large uh, data backups uh, every evening around certain hours or file sizes over certain uh, certain size, which you know are part of your internal data backup. A lot of a lot of different things can play into that. It's important that you can leverage an intelligent filtering that you can uh, sort of create signatures for certain traffic that uh, that you want to filter out. So you want to make sure the solution has that capability, not just basic five tuple uh, uh, network filtering, but the ability to create signatures, pattern match on certain things that you, you want to filter out. Uh, and that's not only important for the, the, the PCAP, but also the metadata. Metadata uh, that surrounds the PCAP and sort of provides the index to the to the actual packets uh, can, can become quite large as well. And, and it's always a good, um, uh, good requirement to, to be able to filter that uh, the same way you, you filter on some of the PCAP intelligently. Again, uh, looking for patterns, certain certain domains in, in DNS traffic that you may not want to save, things like that. Ultra fast search. Obviously, you store all this to disk, and, and this is a piece that gets missed a lot of times. Uh, once you've got this all to disk, that's great. It's there. When you need it, you can go get it. But if it takes you two, three days to run a search over a large database to get uh, the, the packets that you need, obviously that, that's not going to work. Your, your analysts are not going to want to use that solution. They're going to uh, take guesses uh, to, to avoid having to do that. They'll just um, uh, try and live without it. Um, you know, we, we've seen that a lot in the past. We've seen a lot of legacy solutions out there uh, and even newer solutions that, uh, that don't take this part of it into account. Uh, you, you really need to make sure that you can get to the actual packets, reconstruct them, get to the payloads and things like that very quickly. Uh, you want to do it in, in what we say is, is seconds and minutes, not hours and days. Integrated intelligence, obviously, in, in today's world, you want to leverage Intel. Here um, at FireEye, we, we have many Intel feeds. We, we've got a great repository of this, so it's it's a great thing for us. Uh, but you want to also be able to leverage, obviously, third-party feeds. Uh, you want to be able to, to combine that with some of the metadata you're collecting from a forensics perspective and be able to do back-in-time lookups. So the one thing a forensic solution can provide you is the ability to go back in time. You can obviously load uh, indicators into your uh, IPS and firewall solutions and and uh, and highlight things that uh, that are going through the network and detect things and alert on things that are happening right now. But a lot of times, just because you've received an indicator right now doesn't mean it was actually just active the moment you receive it. Could have been active uh, a day, two days, even weeks before uh, and you have no way with a with a real time solution to to look at that. The forensic solution should give you the ability to take that intel, load it into the uh, device, the solution, 
and go back in time. So look for indicators uh, a week back or more that uh, that may have been present in the network and then fetch that traffic and see exactly what was going on before that time. And then lastly, your forensic solution should become a threat hunting platform for you. So it should give your, your tier three analysts and some of those folks the additional ability to, to hunt um, on, on things they may suspect, things that look suspicious, uh, things that, uh, that, that they're kind of intuitively looking at in the network. So it should provide that, that ability and even with some of the orchestration tools, uh, a way to, to hunt in an automated fashion. So you should be able to, to pull up different dashboard views to look at uh, traffic patterns, look at uh, bottom 10 user agents, particularly for, for uh, web traffic, et cetera, things like that that let you kind of hunt for certain things that, that just may not look right uh, in your network. You should also be able to sort of automate some of those and create dashboards. The solution should have the ability to create custom dashboards based on your particular scenarios and, and your network type traffic uh, so that you can have a dashboard for certain things that you know maybe shouldn't be in your network. You can look for certain protocols that shouldn't be there, uh, certain traffic out of the network, certain destinations traffic should never be going to. So you should be able to create those custom dashboards that let you highlight any anomalies uh, in your in your traffic, and then quickly pivot into that traffic uh, to do a quick triage to see if you know it's just a, a, a normal event that doesn't happen very often, or if it is truly uh, a malicious event. So. To kind of highlight the differences, sometimes people will talk about SIMs and log management tools on the forensic side, uh, which which they obviously collect a lot of uh, metadata, log data, uh, in various uh, events so that you can look at them uh, over time and that kind of thing. Uh, but but obviously they're they're not a full forensic solution. Uh, integration with these tools, however, is is key. So the ability to uh, to have your SIM aggregating a lot of the alerts uh, or whatever you use for your, for your alert management or log management and being able to quickly pivot from that to the actual data. So APIs, open APIs here are, are very key to solutions like this. You should be able to integrate with, with third-party tools uh, if obviously no one's ever going to have a, a one vendor solution for everything in their network. So integration with these third-party tools is key uh, and the ability to quickly integrate with new ones is, is key key as well and, and open APIs are, are a big thing to look for there so that you can uh, not only um, uh, pivot but you can include data and say well I'm, I'm pivoting from this event happens to have be around at this time with this IP this port etc and be able to pivot right into a view or pull the data back into that sim uh, for for that particular event you're looking for so again you can build that triage package for your analyst very quickly so he doesn't have to manually copy and paste or enter data in different screens uh, being able to either pull the data the, the the packets and and that back into the sim tool or pivot directly into a view that opens up and has all that data and search populated already for your analyst so what it must include, obviously, is is the the packet capture piece, the the security camera. So uh, we always use that analogy. It's it's the the packet capture tool is sort of like your security cameras. Uh, you know, you you can obviously uh, use metadata from the network, which which will give you a higher layer view. But it, it's sort of more like a a security system that that may tell you well the the back door was open last night at 2 a.m. and it was closed at 3 a.m but it doesn't show you what was going on visually at that time. Was someone walking in and out carrying boxes? Were they loading uh, equipment into, uh, out of the, the warehouse, things like that? So uh, that's kind of a good analogy we, we tend to use. So the, obviously uh, security cameras today have become prevalent in the physical world uh, and, and PCAP is a, is a similar thing in, in the network world. So it gives you the ability to truly see all the data that was going in and out, see what may have gone out of the network? What what was in the files that got out of the network? Was it was it just some random data? Was it unimportant information? Was it credit card numbers? How many credit card numbers? Which credit card numbers? All of these things can can definitely um, uh, lead to lessening the uh, the total cost of an overall breach. And then secondly you need a, a sort of a, a console for all of this. So it's great that you have all these security cameras, but if you've got to go out to each one and say, well, I don't know which one actually saw the data I need, so I've got to go 
view all of these cameras for an hour uh, at this time on each one of them to see if any of them captured this stuff. The, the, the central console should give you that ability to uh, again, from that higher layer metadata level, say, you know, was was someone in a blue coat entering the the warehouse last night at 2 a.m.? So that's that's the kind of level. So you'd be able to say, is uh, was there any uh, again web traffic with a small user agent between these hours? Was there any traffic to this IP at this time? Or again, if you're pivoting from an alert, say which which packet capture device has traffic for. Uh, this IP, this external IP, and uh, and this port, et cetera, at this time, uh, and also reassemble that. So uh, many times there's there's asymmetric routing in some of these networks where uh, traffic may leave a network uh, on one outbound link but come back in on a different one. The solution should have the ability to locate different parts of a stream on different packet capture appliances and reassemble that in a central location. That That's very key as well. So if we, we kind of summarize this, it, the forensic solution um, gives you uh, a, a broader a way to detect and respond to broader to a broad array of security incidents and overall improve the quality of response. Again, reducing that mean time to resolution, giving you the ability to uh, to quickly respond, uh, get to the traffic that matters, letting your analyst uh, work efficiently. Uh, some of the things we talked about there on the on the basic packet capture front was the lossless packet capture. You, you obviously may, again, it may not sound I lost one in a, a million packets or one in a hundred thousand. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but if that happens to be in that large session or that large file transfer that that had some of the exfil data that you need to see during breach, that's going to be a big problem. So you, you never know uh, which packet you're actually going to need. The ability to record at, at data rates, networks are getting faster and faster. The solution needs to be able to keep up with that and keep up with that efficiently. So uh, you don't want a one gig solution that's gonna require uh, 20, uh, 20 small devices to uh, connect to a, uh, a 20 gig link. So uh, that gets overly complicated, costly, the load balancing devices that are required. So you want a solution that, that scales cost effectively for your network so that has enough uh, capacity and and ports to uh, to do it in an efficient manager in a manner and then uh, lastly the intelligent capture side again we talked about that the ability to selectively filter but in a, in an intelligent way not just a, a blunt force sort of uh, well I'll just filter out all this IP address because it's, it's uh, all this network uh, subnet because it's too much traffic for me to handle uh, but intelligently look at certain traffic um, and again, uh, on the encryption side, that, that comes up quite a bit. Uh, so a lot of folks are moving to uh, decryption solutions, man in the middle type uh, solutions to gain visibility to some of that traffic. So uh, you wanna be able to uh, filter out any of the traffic that, you, that you're not gonna decrypt. So you can keep the headers, <clears throat> but you may wanna discard the payload uh, so that uh, it doesn't take up space. Uh, and, and there's many uh, decryption solutions out there on the network that work well. Uh, with the forensic side of things, uh, we, we have our own uh, Annex appliance, which provides which, uh, provides feeds to these devices. So uh, the high fidelity uh, data analysis, ultra fast search, again, uh, it's often overlooked. You, you're like, well, I can get all this traffic to disk and it covers my data rates, but then once the solution's up and running at scale and you're capturing at, at 10 gig and you've got uh, several hundred terabytes of, of packet data and you go to find all the traffic from a compromised host over the last day, you realize that that's gonna take you three, four days to get it all together and even see if your search was the correct one and, 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 and let alone analyzing the data. So you want that search and retrieval of the traffic to be, to be fast as well. And a lot of times folks look at just uh, pinpointed sort of searches and, uh, well, I'm just gonna go get the packets for this session at this time, uh, which is which is one way uh, that, that searches run. But a lot of times you may run into scenarios where a host may have been compromised for a few days and um, either for um, for legal issues and, and, and for your forensics analysis, you may wanna pull all the traffic from that host and store it off uh, offline so that you can do a full analysis and look at everything that was going on uh, and, and even provided in, in legal scenarios. In that case, uh, a lot of solutions uh, can't keep up with that. They, they fall over in that scenario where you're gonna retrieve uh, uh, 
terabytes of, of data from uh, one device off the, the disks. Integrated intelligence, uh, that, that was mentioned as well. That, that's key in this day and age. You want to integrate uh, good intel with these solutions, again, to give you that back in time visibility. So um, you know, putting the uh, IOCs out there for your real-time solution is one thing, but uh, having the ability to go back in time Drill down, easy drill down, obviously. Once you have that data, you want the solution to have everything in the console. You don't want to have to export that packet data to another tool, open up the packets in some other tool for visibility, uh, take it to another tool to reconstruct the session. If you want to, for instance, visit, uh, view the web page or the email that was in there, you want that all to happen in the same console and be able to drill down right from there. Um, and then you want something that, that's flexible and, and will grow uh, with your uh, network and that provides you in enhanced visibility. So being able to decode packets like a Wireshark shark type view where you can look at the packet payload is one thing, but uh, you wanna look for higher layer capabilities, uh, session decoders, decoder chaining. Oftentimes when your analysts are gonna look at this data, they um, it may be base 64 encoded, it may be zipped, and it may be multiple levels of that. Uh, some malicious actors do multiple levels to try and obscure the data. So uh, you wanna make sure that some of those tools are built into your solution as well. Uh, and then the flexible platform, distributed, large enterprise needs. Again, you wanna make sure it has that central console to give you visibility and that that central console can scale uh, to multiple tiers and, and, and be flexible. Uh, and provide you that, that ability to threat hunt across the network. So some of the other things that are key that we haven't talked about in uh, evaluating storage uh, for, for forensic solutions and, and just in storage in general, which is a key part of these solutions. So uh, you definitely want to make sure that uh, the solution you select uh, can scale and, and have data protection encryption for the drives and that your storage calculations are correct. So there's there's sort of three parts to this. The initial piece is when you're looking at a forensic solution and you're sizing it, you wanna make sure you're getting actual numbers and, and usable storage. So the storage world gets kind of uh, interesting where you, you, know, you have sort of the raw storage numbers, which is what's typically used by a lot of vendors to put out there, but then you have to calculate storage numbers with the RAID enabled. So RAID is the, the protection on these storage devices. They will typically, you'll want to make sure that the solution is leveraging a RAID 5 or, or even a RAID 6, which is a higher level of uh, protection for your data. You don't want to have a RAID 0 type of thing where if you have 40 drives in your system and one of those drives happens to fail, all of your data for the past month is now unreadable and unusable. Uh, things like RAID 6 give you the ability to have up to two drives fail and still protect the rest of the data on the system and be able to rebuild it and recover from that. So you wanna make sure the solutions take advantage of that, but that comes into play that needs to be subtracted out from your overall numbers. So when you're looking at the storage you're gonna need, if it's, uh, you know, you, you, you do the bandwidth calculations and you need to make sure that's done correctly as well. So you, you may have uh, five gig of traffic on average uh, on, on the links you're looking to monitor and you wanna make sure you take into account that that's, is it during working hours? Is that five gig on average 24 hours a day? Uh, you want to make sure that when you're talking to vendors that they're not trying to undersell you by using lower numbers. Well, we're just going to use the five gig for two hours a day and we'll give you that number and then we're just going to give you some raw storage numbers. So you want to make sure you're getting the actual storage numbers with all of the overhead and, and RAID enabled, that the storage calculations are correct, that you're actually uh, getting the the average bandwidth numbers or peak bandwidth numbers uh, for the amount of time you're you're going to use. Too often we see uh, vendors that have sold solutions that are way undersized. Customers uh, typically may want uh, a month of of PCAP storage, uh, two two weeks to a month, and uh, and sometimes they'll they'll get a solution from another vendor that uh, winds up being just a, a day or two. So you want to be very careful with those calculations and and how they're done. Uh, that becomes uh, even more important, obviously, in the cloud. Again, this is where some of the intelligent filtering will, will come into play, but cloud storage solutions can uh, become quite uh, expensive and cost prohibitive. So uh, uh, you want to make sure you have intelligent filtering so you don't 
Force 5 tuple filter to kind of filter out most of your traffic. And then you also want to make sure, lastly, that the storage solution scales both uh, horizontally, <laughs> horizontally, or, uh, horizontally and vertically. Uh, so, um, uh, and what that means is, uh, for instance, with with your metadata solution, you want to make sure that uh, you can cluster that, so that you can uh, have uh, add processing as you add uh, as you add storage. So you can cluster that solution as well as federate it. You want to be able to have this uh, solution be distributed. So you don't want to be taking uh, metadata that your PCAP device is generating and having to funnel that all the way up to a cloud solution or all the way back to some central location. You want to make sure that the, the metadata, the indexing, and the PCAP portion of it can live next to each other and, and close together in a, in a distributed fashion. And then you have a central manager that, that can bring that all together and provide searches across that install base. Uh, and the, the, the storage solutions should also play well with, with third-party um, storage solutions. So you should look for devices that give you the op option of leveraging SAN solutions and, and things like that. So uh, folks like uh, uh, NetApp EMC, that, that you can leverage uh, external third-party solutions if, if you require it. Uh, or if you want to leverage that type of device, if, if that's something that your your um, enterprise does a lot of work with or you have certain purchasing agreements with. So you should should look at that side of it as well. Oftentimes that can be a little more expensive, but it's, it's something to uh, to consider. So you want to make sure that uh, from a storage perspective, you, you can scale and then and then Vertically, you want to make sure that the individual PCAP appliances uh, can scale vertically, so they're uh, not having to add lots of processing overhead each time you want to add just a small amount of storage. So you should be able to add sort of um, headless storage shelves or what we call JBODs uh, to, to these devices. So you want to look for PCAP devices that can handle at least up to a petabyte of storage behind one device. You don't want a device that uh, that only does a, a couple hundred terabytes and then has to add a, a lot more processing and a more expensive shelf uh, just to increase storage. You should be able to increase storage just by adding storage. So sort of uh, this, this slide sort of looks at uh, network forensics in your network, where, where does it fit, where do, uh, uh, where do customers usually put it. So uh, typically you're gonna see the forensic solution in front of uh, high value assets, so uh, data centers, things like that. Uh, you'll also see customers obviously on their north-south links uh, uh, behind the firewall, uh, sometimes also with a feed in front of the firewall to kind of get a view of, of what uh, what's going in and out of the firewall. So uh, we, we see that sometimes um, uh, the, the customers will also uh, enable capture behind the firewall so they get full visibility and then just enable metadata or flow information in uh, on the external side of the firewall just to get an idea of, of how much traffic is, is being blocked and, and what type of traffic that is. And, uh, and run some analysis and, and uh, on that. So again, you should have that ability to create some of these custom dashboards that can give you these different views. You may wanna look at what's happening outside the firewall uh, in certain ways, and then uh, do your forensics, obviously, on the traffic that's inside the firewall. Uh, the solution should also, obviously, going forward, have, have virtual capabilities. Uh, it's becoming more and more important in today's world. So either the ability to deploy virtually on-site uh, or in the cloud, uh, going forward. So what does the future of, of network forensics look like? Um, kind of look at uh, retrospective analysis and, and cloud solutions. So uh, retrospective, again, the ability to uh, go back in time and uh, provide you that uh, uh, that analysis of an event so that you can uh, be better armed for it in the future. So if you look at sort of a, a life cycle there of events and policy, prevent, detect, respond, predict. So in that response portion is, is where uh, the forensics piece lives, obviously. Uh, it gives you that ability to remediate, but it also gives you that ability to investigate uh, and provide that retrospective view that will help you get better in the future. So it's one thing to say, well, we, we had a breach, we cleaned up this device, uh, we're not really sure how someone actually got onto that, uh, there wasn't enough data, we don't know if someone clicked on a link. Well, 
the the network forensic solution gives you the ability to fully triage an event and become better at blocking those events in the future. So you want to be able to go uh, again back in time, uh, look at the traffic that um, that got into that device. How did how did someone get in? Did they move laterally? Uh, what uh, what things did they do uh, in the lateral movement? How far did they how far were they able to get? Um, what did they get out of the network? Um, what type of traffic? What type of uh, files, data were they trying to get out of the network? When you can actually see that, you can see what type of things they were targeting. Were they targeting passwords? Were they targeting uh, intellectual property? Were they targeting uh, financial data, credit card numbers, things like that? So uh, it gives you a better visibility into what some of these attackers were actually trying to uh, uh, to do in the network and what, what they were trying to get out of that network. Uh, cloud solutions, obviously, tying in um, to, to cloud going forward, and that, that's where, again, Again, intelligent capture comes into play, the ability to intelligently filter so that you're, you don't uh, wind up spending uh, an overabundance of, of money on, on, uh, on cloud storage, so that, that can become quite difficult. And that ability to keep uh, not only the PCAP but the meta metadata storage together, uh, again, so that uh, you don't have to ship things uh, either up to a cloud or down from the cloud uh, in certain scenarios. You want that PCAP traffic to stay local because that's a, a lot of bandwidth to, to ship around. So you want the ability to keep that local but have quick access and searches of it. Again, tying in with orchestration and automation, that, that's another key point. We see a lot of that here. Uh, we have our own orchestration solution that, that we tie into, but uh, that ability to, to orchestrate some of these events and, and the forensic solution, so the ability to grab certain traffic, pull the data back, possibly uh, open some of it up in a uh, uh, in a reconstruction view where you, act, you can actually see uh, the, the web traffic, the email, the files, uh, possibly send uh, certain files out for uh, a deeper analysis. Uh, here again at FireEye, we have our, our, our AX appliance uh, that, uh, that provides a, a very in-depth detonation of objects and uh, gives you an entire uh, OS change report, shows you exactly uh, what was going on, what that object was trying to do. Uh, so the ability to integrate via orchestration with tools like that, have all that done before your analyst even has to touch touch anything, uh, is a great way to um, uh, to to make these these guys more these folks more efficient uh, going forward. So the ability to uh, uh, triage that, provide the PCAP data, possibly provide analysis of the object, analysis of URLs, and then bring that all back into a dashboard view that's already pre-done for an analyst is, is a great way to save, uh, obviously, a lot of time in triaging some of these events. Uh, the, the last piece we'll mention, a lot of this ties into uh, there, there's new markets emerging. One of one of those is is the NTA network traffic analysis market. Uh, so you'll you'll see that kind of uh, uh, mentioned in some of the the new Gartner reports coming out. Uh, we we really see that more of a of a network threat analysis market. Uh, and um, you know when you start looking at at traffic analysis, there's a lot of legacy operational uh, traffic analysis solutions out there that were more geared toward. Uh, looking at network latencies and things like that, uh, there's there's been a large pivot, pivot as as folks look to uh, to see to get more visibility into lateral movement and and what's going on. Again, we talked about how attackers are getting into the network and now sort of sort of staying stealthy, laterally moving around the network, trying to find high value assets and and ways into servers and things like that, rather than immediately trying to call home. So. Uh, the ability to to find some of that lateral movement early on is is key, uh, and that's um, uh, it's a bit of a stretch for some of the older operational type analysis solutions. Uh, we're, we're we're looking at it more from a, a a threat analysis perspective, actually looking for the lateral move traffic and tying that in with the forensic solution. So the forensic solution is is a great. Um, part of, of, of any of those uh, traffic analysis solutions because it gives you that, that visibility overall. You might want to create timelines of what's going on with the host. You might want to uh, look at certain traffic to high value at, uh, assets inside the network and highlight any anomalies there. You may want to look for uh, there shouldn't be anybody uh, SSHing to this host from uh, uh, from this this portion of the network over time. So uh, a lot of uh, anomalies and things you can start to 
highlight uh, uh, internally in the network. So if you start to move the forensics visibility deeper into the network, uh, you can start to see some of that, that lateral movement and start to hunt for some of that, uh, as well as tie it in with the lateral move alerting and then give you a quick way to, to triage that and say, well, was someone logging into this host for a valid reason uh, or uh, was this this actually some attempt at lateral movement movement with privilege escalation, et cetera? Um, so um, some of those obviously anomalies need to uh, leverage forensics a lot more. When you're looking at things from an anomaly based perspective, uh, you know you're you're not quite sure often if that's uh, a true threat. Uh, it's something that doesn't happen normally. So is that a threat? Well, not always. So uh, being able to quickly uh, analyze and and uh, uh, and and um, triage those those events is is going to be key to that uh, that side of the market in this lateral movement world uh, going forward so the ability to to pull all that data together triage it reconstruct it and see was this really malicious or was this just something that doesn't happen very often and uh, and is going on now so Uh, and that uh, that wraps it up from our end. So that's uh, uh, I think we could look at any any questions at this point. Uh, take any uh, any questions from out there. And uh, thanks again for uh, listening to uh, to our talk here on network forensics. And thank you, uh, Bill. Uh, this is Rob A. U. Pass it back over. Manager for network security here at FireEye, and I'm going to manage the the Q and A portion of this webinar. Please feel free to mm -hmm. submit any questions you might have in the chat, and we will be happy to grill Bill here a little bit. Um, Bill, you know, you and I, just, as the questions are coming in, we we talk to a number of customers and, you know, the, the security skill shortage always comes up. Uh, how are you seeing that skill shortage impact the interest or the use of tools for forensics these days? Uh, you know, do you see companies doing things differently, using their tools differently? Uh, how do you see that playing out given that folks are struggling to find the right talent? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the things we see, uh, and, and uh, here at FireEye, we obviously have our, our managed defense teams. Uh, we we see some customers that uh, either uh, have a very small SOC or, or don't have uh, the the um, third tier analyst or the ability to do some of the forensics investigations. We see them leverage our forensics tools with our, our managed defense service. So our, our managed defense team can uh, deploy our, our solution as part of their offering. Uh, and, and the great part of that is that once you have the forensic solution in place, if they do see that uh, that you have an attempted breach, uh, they can immediately do some investigation. They, they leverage a lot of uh, interesting signatures and, and, and capabilities on the forensic solution. And uh, uh, they obviously have the expertise to quickly triage and, and uh, uh, and deeply analyze some of that traffic. So being able to dive into the uh, the nuts and bolts there is is uh, uh, is is good from that perspective. Uh, but we also see uh, the the forensic solution. We've we've um, uh, improve the ability to combine it with other tools and, and make it easier to, to use. So, um, you know, ev even if you, you don't have uh, uh, lots of security analysts in your organization, uh, the one or two folks that, that leverage this solution, uh, combining that forensics with our orchestration tools and other capabilities, again, so that analysts just have one view and one dashboard that pulls up all the rel relevant data for uh, a suspected event, uh, it makes that 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 person much more efficient. So um, you know we we see a lot of that. We see orchestration coming into play more, uh, and what what we used to call sort of a pivot to PCAP, so that ability to to go right out of a SIM event uh, right to a forensics console uh, that has all the data. There's a your question is here. Need is, is um, something we see a lot. It's really about about sort of competitive and and what vendors are claiming about uh, uh, full packet data versus metadata. Um, can you talk a little bit more about why why some solutions, you know, why full why we see full packet as being so critical to forensics compared to metadata only? And the question talks a little bit about vulnerability management and SIM and and, so, and even firewalls providing forensic data. But I think really the what you know the, from our perspective, why why do we see the full packet piece is so critical when there's there's actually a lot of noise out there in the market about 
you know, maybe not needing it as much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, there, there's a lot of talk of, of, of metadata and um, uh, some of the things you can do with it. And there, there's definitely a lot of tools out there that, that uh, uh, you can output it from uh, at, at different levels, uh, uh, obviously enabling it on some existing solutions. We, we tend to see that fall short if you want your your, your firewall to uh, to generate metadata. Obviously, that's a, that's an additional load. Uh, there, there's some level you can do there. But uh, uh, but then again, how how deep do you get into that? Do you get full file reconstruction and the MD5s for that file? Uh, probably not. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a lot of tools out there. It also goes back to the old days of, um, you know, routers uh, can generate flow information, but oftentimes uh, when customers turn that on, uh, you know, that that brings a lot of the, the router capabilities down and throughput down. So uh, most of the time that got shut off. But so same scenario today. Uh, and, and metadata is great and it, and it can provide that that index and it can provide a lot of good visibility and, and a good metadata solution like like our tools provide some very deep uh, deep level of, of metadata across all of our our network products. Uh, you know, each one of them will, will do the same level of, of deep metadata analysis. But if if you don't have that ability to pivot back down into the data, it it always does leave you a, a bit blind. Uh, again, you may you may know you know relating back to the video camera, you may know someone opened the door at 2 a.m. Uh, and maybe even that person had a blue coat on. But well. What did that person do? I, I don't know. Did they did they walk in and out quickly? Did they walk out with ten boxes of you know charts and uh, IP? So uh, you, you don't quite know that. So that that full packet capture gives you that ability. You know, was, we we had a, a great meeting with a CISO of a very large healthcare uh, at one point, and um, uh, we mentioned some of the the abilities to do some of the filtering and things like that. Uh, and he uh, immediately shot back that uh, that that's not something he'd ever be interested in, uh, because again, he he had no idea which packet would be malicious in the future, and he had no idea which protocol, what what folks were going to use going forward. So he didn't want to filter anything. He wanted to save every single packet to disk for for a period right. of time, so that uh, when something did got, happen, uh, he could go back and find out exactly what questions. they were doing. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, one question uh, around uh, how long do most customers want to store their data and how does it vary? Uh, I mean, do you see some maybe some industry trends or is it completely sort of based on ind by vertical and, and those sorts of things? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Rob. Um, you know, the it it does sometimes uh, depend by industry. We 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 do see uh, uh, a lot of of government and healthcare and financial folks want to uh, store around thirty days of 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 packet data, full packet data, uh, and then and then metadata possibly three to six months out. So, um, uh, you know, that that seems to be the norm in some of those areas. Uh, outside of that, t two weeks is usually a minimum for the, the full PCAP and then metadata again up to, to about three months. But interestingly enough, uh, starting uh, probably last year or so, we're, we're starting to see a trend of, of folks wanting to go even beyond that. We're, we're definitely seeing folks want to extend the, the PCAP out to, to a minimum of 30 days. Uh, and sometimes a bit more of that and and metadata out to a year as well. So uh, we're definitely seeing the amount of time and the amount of storage that that folks want uh, increasing uh, as as obviously this this insider thread and, la and lateral move becomes more and more of an issue, um, the ransomware stuff and things like that. So being able to go back and find out uh, uh, what folks were doing in the network, what uh, what they may have gotten out of the network, uh, it, it's becoming more and more important. Well, at this so, point, uh, uh, so we definitely see those, have any other uh, those requirements growing. Bill, thanks again. This has been really great. And um, I guess that's all for today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, look forward to other future webcasts. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot.